been a pleasure to have you in Sahapedia. And we are very happy to have you here also because we are an open online encyclopedia and we have been very interested in your work for a long time. So you are well known in the world, I would say, as an information activ activist who has made information on the public domain across the world. Would you like to tell us something about your background and how you got into this field which is so worthy of, of uh, as a career? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gopalakrishnan. It's a real pleasure to be here, first of all. I'm a huge fan of Sahapedia. You do some amazing work. Um, I uh, uh, started working on the internet a long time ago, and uh, in the early 1980s, when the internet was so small that there was a file that had a list of all the computers in it, and you could actually pull it up and, and look at all the computers on the internet. And I started, I, I had a background in economics and public policy, but I kind of dove into computers because the, the PC had been invented and, and I started working on the internet. Um, but it, it, it occurred to me that this was much more about like sending email or chat rooms, that, that the internet was something that could be used to help change the world. And I wasn't the only one who felt that, obviously. There were many people all over the world. And I ended up devoting my career to using the internet to actually doing things. Um, I um, started the first radio station on the internet, for example, what, what you now know of as podcasting. Uh, but it seemed to me that this network might actually be used for audio. And it was so much fun to do that. Um, I. I uh, uh, put the speeches from the National Press Club online. We had the Dalai Lama streamed live on the internet in 1994, for example. The, the government databases on the internet, when did that idea strike you? That struck me. So I had done some early work in the early, very early 90s, 1991, on putting standards online, on putting the technical definitions of how telephone networks work. But when I was running the radio station, uh, we were called in front of the U.S. Congress for Chairman Edward Markey, who's now a U.S. Senator. And it was kind of the uh, demo of the Internet. It wasn't just me. It was uh, people at Sun Microsystems like Eric Schmidt were, were there and uh, many others. And it was a big demo. And then at the very end, I was called into the back room because Chairman Markey was in charge of telecommunications, but also finance. And he said, you know, we have a letter here from some people that worked with Ralph Nader asking why the Securities and Exchange Commission was not on the internet. Because in those days, if you wanted to report on, on, on a corporation, right, every company in the US has to file an annual report and a quarterly report, um, you had to pay $30 uh, to do that. And he wanted to know why this database was not available for free. Yeah, that's hmm. a question. Didn't you find some resistance from core groups who wanted to, who didn't want that much of openness about public records? There were two groups that objected. One was the industry, the people that were selling these reports for $30 each. But the other was the government. Um, we called the Securities and Exchange Commission in, and they had this system put together in which they had a vendor, and they gave the data to the vendor. And the theory was that that this data wasn't usable by real people, so you needed to polish it to add value. And so they, they had this $30 million deal with the vendor, and the vendor in turn sold it to information retailers, who in turn sold it to the public. And when we called them in, right, this was in the congressman's office, and the SEC came in, and they said, you know, we just don't think the internet has the right kind of people. There's just no need. And the theory was that only a few people needed this information, Wall Street, and they had lots of money. So why should we give this away when we could sell it to these people who had lots of money? And they said, well, we just don't think the internet has the right kind of people. And I couldn't help myself. And I, I looked this guy in the face and I said, you know, I think the American people are the right kind of people. And one of the staffers kicked me. He was like, behave, Carl. Uh, <laughs> but, but what I found is that when we put this database online, millions of people started using it. And, and it wasn't just Wall Street. It was college students wanting to research places they might go work. It was journalists 
who couldn't pay $30 a report for 100 reports to write an article. It was senior citizen investment clubs. It was millions of people. And different music groups started finding this very relevant and useful. They did, absolutely. So did that the government policy change after that? Well, they did with a little bit of kicking. Um, <laughs> so I ran it for two years, and uh, it was they, the, the the computer staff was very resistant. They said, "Oh no, no, no! You know, if you use the SEC database on the internet, be very careful because there might be viruses, which is nonsense. These were text files, but they went ahead and did that anyway." Um, but after two years, what I did is, by then the World Wide Web had been invented, and so we were running a website, and I put a sign up on the web saying, this service will terminate in 60 days. So which year was that? Uh, this was 19, so I began the database January 1994, and near the end of 95, I decided it was time to do something, because otherwise I'd be running this thing forever, and my position is it wasn't my job, it was the government's job to run this database. Um, and so I put a sign up saying this service will close in 60 days. Click here to send mail to Vice President Gore. Click here to send mail to the Speaker of the House. Click here to send mail to the Chairman of the SEC. Now, the Chairman didn't have email. And so we set up a box for him. 17,000 people sent in email. 17,000. And so we printed those all out. We printed them on stacks of paper. We printed them out because he didn't have email, and we, we brought them down to the SEC, and we handed them. And after some hearings and some discussions, the SEC said, okay, fine, it's our job. And then they came back and said, well, you know, maybe it's our job, but we can't do this in 60 days. Can you extend the deadline to one year or two years? And I said, no, we're, we're not going to do that. But here's what we will do. And so we loaned them our computers. We gave them our software. We configured their internet line. And they were up and running within the 60 days. And then a mir two miracles happened. Um, one is that the SEC became a huge fan because they were running the government's busiest web server. And all the computer guys were really proud. And they were getting big new computers right, that they could use. And then the second thing that happened is the industry came up to me, one of the industrial folks that was selling these reports. And he goes, you know, Carl, our revenues went up. Because they thought we were going to put them out of business. They said, we made more money. Because what happened is many, many more people were using the reports. And if you were serious, if you were a day trader, you would then go do the commercial service. And so by giving away the core data, that actually helps business. Because more people know about it. And the ones that are serious subscribe to all these wonderful professional services. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But uh, when did this public resource.org the work on that start, or was it all simultaneous? No, no. So I ran internet multicasting service in the 90s, and, and then, you know, the internet got real big really quick and all commercial, and, and it was hard to fund a nonprofit because everybody was trying to, like, be the next Google and, and folks like that. Um, so I spent a couple years, I worked for John Podesta at the Center for American Progress and uh, did some consulting helping the internet standards bodies. And then in 2007, I started Public Resource. Oh, I see. Okay. And so we've been in business now for 11, 12 years. So what yeah. does the public, uh, what does the publicresource.org actually do? What is the mission of that uh, initiative? The mission is access to knowledge with a particular focus on, on public knowledge, on government works, for example, um, making them available. So I began um, in 2007 by tackling an area that I thought was too hard in the 90s, which is making the law available, making the law of, of, uh, of the United States and then the rest of the world available. So how does it work? How, does, how do you network and how do you make it accessible? What is the, what is the methodology by which you work on that? So do you, are you, do you ally with institutions or do you go to the government sources? And what is the, how does it work, pan out? Well, so I have a particular methodology that I use, which is I look for data that exists. So we're, we're not a think tank. Um, we don't issue papers on net neutrality or Aadhaar, although I'm interested in both of those issues. I look for real databases that are not available, 
that should be available. And I'm, I'm not, you know, we're nothing like WikiLeaks or anything. I don't do national security. I'm not digging secrets out. I'm looking for things that almost everybody agrees should be public, but for some reason, uh, a, a, a company has it, right? Or the government has it but hasn't made it available. And then I engage in an effort and I put it online. I, I do show, uh, show by doing, right? And so I put it online and I get people to use it and then I go to the government or other institutions and I say, you know what, this is your job. You need to do this. And so it's a combination of very technical database work, right, working in the big leagues of the internet to put these very large databases online, but also activism, and in many cases the government might object to what yeah, I'm that's doing. That's a question I've had. Don't you find resistance to that much of openness from Western interests, even from other sources? Even so I expected industry to object to what I'm doing, right? You can kind of see why if you're in the business and you have the sole contract, you might object. I didn't expect government to be upset and I didn't expect the level of reaction that we received in some cases. I'm in court on three continents right now. Um, people really care about this stuff, about keeping their vested interests. If, if you are poaching on public lands, right, you've built a hotel in, in a public park, you really want to keep that hotel and you're willing to go to court you're willing to attack. And I was just surprised by that level of reaction. Um, in the US, we put a lot of public court records online, the, the district courts, the PACER yes. database. Public access to courts. Uh, uh, yeah, public uh, PACER, public access to court electronic records. Now, everybody agrees these are public. There, there's some that are private, like you know, personal family law. But you know, the opinions of our courts are public because you can't have rule of law if the courts function um, in darkness. And when we took 20 million pages of court documents off of a public server, the U.S. courts called the FBI on us. Uh, and the FBI staked out my young friend Aaron Schwartz's house and they, they investigated us and tried to see if we had committed a crime. Uh, we hadn't um, and the FBI told the courts that we had done nothing wrong but they called the FBI on us twice. Once after they discovered we had the records and then after the FBI had told them there's nothing to see here, the New York Times wrote it up and the courts called the FBI again and tried to see if we maybe had done something wrong, and of course we hadn't. Um, but that, that made me realize that we were playing for real, and it made me study civil resistance in great depth, and it's one of the things that brought me to India, because if you're looking at how you confront authority, you naturally look at Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, but of course you look at, at Gandhiji because that, that is the, the, the master class in how one talks to authority. Yeah. Um, so apart from the US, which other countries in the world have you worked on this? I mean, have you been working with other countries also? So uh, Public Resource does two things now. Yeah. One is we are pursuing the idea that public safety codes that are the law, like building codes and fire codes, should be available. Um, and you know, in most of the world, building codes cost money, even though they are crucial to the public safety. In India, the National Building Code of India is 14,000 rupees. Um, in the US, it might cost you $1,000 to buy the law of California, the, the, the building code, electrical code, plumbing code, fire code. These are laws. They're some of our most important laws. And so we're pursuing that um, in India. In Europe, we just sued the European Commission in the, in the European Court of Justice and pitched litigation in the United States. We are being sued by six plaintiffs for having posted things like the National Electrical Code and it's been in court for several years. Uh, we have law firms, all our law firms represent us pro bono. They work for free because they believe in the rule of law. And so in the United States, it's Fenwick um, and West and EFF, a leading public interest law firm. 
Uh, in Europe, we have several very good lawyers. In India, it's the firms of Jawahar um, uh, Raja, uh, Nishith Desai, and Mr. Salman Khurshid all represent us pro bono. Um, and so we're pursuing the idea that edicts of government, the law, must be available. And so we do that globally. Most of my time, though, now is focused on India. I, so I did a pivot. That's the other question I wanted yeah. to ask. Let's come to your work pertaining to India on the uh, on public knowledge. And what do you mean? I mean, the, you also I think have been um, supporting something called universal access to knowledge in India. What is that? I have. Well, that's a motto. That's that's a dream. That's a vision that, that knowledge must be available. Right. Um, well, many of us here share that ideal, but and an idea. But how does one go about doing that? Well, and, and that's always the trick. How do you go from a dream to something real? Now, there are efforts already in India. There's a National Digital Library of India. Yes. Um, the Tamil Nadu government has been scanning lots of books. Not but, just one uh, state, but many. I think, do, do you agree that there is more uh, understanding and more emphasis on uh, scanning and digitizing and putting them online than it used to be maybe five Yes, years so India, there's great in, there's a great thirst for knowledge here. Um, the largest democracy in the world, uh, amazingly large educational system, much of knowledge has become colonized. If you want scientific journals, um, there are English companies that assert copyright and say you may not use scientific journals, and that means that in many universities the students don't have access to the knowledge they need. There's a great thirst, there are many efforts, but I don't think it's nearly enough. I, I think we need to supercharge the level of making knowledge available, not only in India, but in the world. But I have become convinced that if there's going to be a revolution in access to knowledge, it has to start in India. And I think it needs to be much more. And so I have been talking about a vision of a public library of India. And I believe we should be digitizing two to three million books a year for a decade. And I think if we don't do that in India, if we don't scan the Sanskrit books and the Gujarati books and the Bangla books and the Malayalam books, right, um, we won't, nobody else is going to do that. It has to be here. And I think that is a tremendous national treasure that right now is lying fallow that we can put on the internet, make available to every student in India and every citizen in India so that they can access the knowledge that they want to educate themselves. And I think but it's a doable think there goal. Are Western interests here, or at least in terms of those who, who have these records, I mean, maybe not in the government, but that is perhaps more accessible. If one has, a, if the government has a way, but other than that, those in the pub, private domain, there needs to be more awareness and slow, slowly getting them to understand, making them understand. Or is there a problem, or just to how does how does one go about? Well, that? so change. Yeah. I I have learned that change always takes a long time. And and when I talk to my young friends who are civic hackers and they go to a hackathon, and then they go home. And then a month later, they go to a hackathon. But it, it takes a sustained effort. It took me a decade to put the US patent database online. I've been working on building codes for 12 years. So I think you need to take a series of steps. Yes, there are vested interests. But I also think you can show them there's a better way. So for example, um, we have a group of volunteers in Chennai, in Bengaluru, in Mangaluru that are really interested in digitizing books, books in Canada, books in Telugu, uh, books about science. And the Indian Academy of Sciences is working with us. So we have a, a very good scanner in, at the Indian Academy of Sciences. And our volunteers have been going in, scanning hundreds of books, but doing it at really high quality and putting them on the Internet Archive for open access. And once it's on the Internet Archive, anybody can take those books and put them on their local college campus. Um, and we call this group the Servants of Knowledge, uh, hat tip to Gokhale. Um, and the idea is that you can decentralize. So you know, it's OK to have big government efforts. 
but I also think that, that there's groups all over India, uh, yes. Sabarmati Ashram, for That's example. Right. That, right. Yeah. Uh, then about, say, 15 or 20 years back, I think there's now a kind of more renewed interest in Indian knowledge systems and Indian yeah. thought processes. And I think, we, like you mentioned, the young generation. I think the young generation is more open to making access free than perhaps I mean, the, yeah. the generation that gone by or maybe the generation. So I, I have been all over India. I do every other month here. I've been commuting to India and I've been doing this for a year. And I go visit many libraries. And in many of them, um, they say, we're digitizing books. I say, oh, really? How are you doing that? Well, we bought all these big scanners and we have a vendor and they're scanning our books. I said, well, that's, that's nice. Can I have a copy? Well, we've been digitizing, but we don't have a website yet, and we're going to put them on a website eventually. And then when they put them on a website, it's in a little screen reader, but you can't download them. You can't download a whole book. And even worse, you can't download all the books. And I think you should share public knowledge. So we're doing, we're doing two pieces. So we're beginning with this whole servants of knowledge, right? We're trying to like scan at scale and do a good job. And that gets pushed into the Internet Archive. And then we pull that data back out of the Internet Archive and we bring it back to India. So we have computers at JNU and at IIT Delhi. And those are called a data depot. And the vision is that we're going to slice as much of the Internet Archive off as we can and all the other resources that are being digitized, push them back up into these big systems. We have over 500 terabytes of disk spinning. And that's on the National Knowledge Network. And that's going to allow every university in India to download this information. Um, Even the Digital Library of India had scanners put in at many repositories. And they were also doing a lot of digitization and putting together of manuscripts, for example, Indian manuscripts uh, from all over, the, uh, all over India, many places at least. How does this, well, does this one differ from that kind of an issue? Well, it's, it's sort of the same and sort of different. So the Digital Library of India was a long-term effort to scan books, and they scanned 5.5 uh, lock books. They didn't do a very good job. I, I, I hate to say it because I, I know they spent a lot of time on it. Um, and you know, the scanning stopped quite a few years ago, but it was running on a government server. But, but the scans were missing pages, and it was low quality, and the titles were wrong, and many of the books were in copyright, and they hadn't like, done their homework properly. And this was on a government server that I discovered a few years ago. And I made a copy of it. So have you made standards for digitization across, I mean, across the board, across different documents? And are there standards available that, are, that you may be using? Yeah, so there, there are accepted best current practices. Um, you know, for example, you should scan at proper resolution so that the optical character recognition. But, but what's important to understand is, is in many of these places, they scan, and then that's it. But you know, it's, it's a pipeline. You have to scan, and then you fix the scans, right? You have to like make them straight. You need the title. You need the creator. So you need the metadata. It needs to be put online. Optical character recognition. It needs to be hosted. It's, it's, it's a pipeline. It's not just, I scanned, I'm done. And that's what we're trying to instill in our volunteers. Uh, who are very technical. These are people that run computer groups or run computers for a living. And I've, I've recruited them. I've said, come, come do something public with us. Um, and they are, in turn, teaching other people these standards and how it works and the right way of doing it. And I think it's a matter of education, right? It's not just saying, here's the standard. Uh, although, you know, some people... No, but also yeah. standard OCR, for example. Mm -hmm. India is a multilingual country. Mm -hmm. So have has work been satisfactory for uh, OCR? So the Internet Archive does not do OCR on non-Roman languages right now. They, they just don't do, they don't do Hindi. They don't do, um, but there are places that do it. So for example, Google Vision is, is we've been testing it. Is that, that's a Google Cloud service. It's very good on, on Bangla, on, on Telugu, on Kannada. And so one of our big efforts this year is we're trying to 
pull the books off the Internet Archive, bounce them off one of these commercial services. We're actually hoping Google will support us, will give us free access. We have a proposal into them. Um, and then push it back into the Internet Archive with the OCR. So one of our main goals, and we're doing it on more than books. I'm working with my friend Dr. Sushant Sinha, who runs Indian Canoe, which is all the, the court opinions of India on a free server. And we have mirrored all the official gazettes of India. So that's the other yeah. thing. Archiving is not just limited to printed text, but it's also to do with many, the music, performances, mm -hmm. you know, so many in monuments. In the, if you even spoke, speaking from the field of culture, there is so much that needs to be done and then uh, so it's... Oh, there are some tremendous archives in India. For example, All India Radio. None of their archives are available. You know, Nehru's Tryst with Destiny speech was over seven minutes long, but the only audio available is about three minutes. But the full speech is not there. Now, it's possible it got destroyed, but I don't think so. I think it's in those archives. Um, I believe the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts is, is an amazing treasure chest. Um, and they've done a good job. They have a national cultural audiovisual archives, but it's, it's limited. It's, it's streaming only, right? And some of this is public. Now, I understand some stuff is, is not public, but many of the works of government in India have copyright assertions on them. That's the question I was talking yeah. to you about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How does one go about, how does one circumvent the copyright issues while you're doing, making it open? Well, okay, one has to be careful, but it is my contention. So if you look at the Ministry of Information, the Publications Division, so largest, yes. largest publisher in India, right? Um, amazing work. Um, Sahapedia has these beautiful series of books about the presidential palaces. Um, they published the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. They have 60 volumes of the builders of modern India. And when I am in India, I go to the government bookstores and I buy their books. And in fact, in December, I bought 180 kilos of books from government bookstores. And, I, and at that time, I shipped them back to the US. We're now scanning them in Bangalore. And I put them online. Now, there is a copyright assertion, but, um, and one has to be very careful. If, if you see something that says copyright and you take it upon yourself to post it on the internet, you better have a very good story. And I advise people, don't do this unless you're going to be careful because you may bear the consequences. So I, I understand that buying Ministry of Information Publications Division books, scanning them and putting them online may land me in so hot water. You're worried about permissions also? I did not ask for permission, and here's why. And, but I thought about this very carefully. Um, the Ministry of Information sells these books very, very cheaply. They're not making any profit on these things. They're, I don't even think they're covering their printing costs, frankly, if you go to the bookstore and buy these things. They're, they're very cheap. Um, it is meant to only cover their cost. The vast majority of these books have not been scanned, are not available online. Many of these books, they no longer print. Right? They, they were from the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. And so I've scanned hundreds of these things and put them online. And I would love to give a disk drive to the publications division and work with them to put all these online. Same thing with the archaeological survey, the Indian Council of Agricultural Resource, uh, Research, the, the uh, CCRT, the, the uh, cultural... Yeah, I have a proposal into the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts to work with them because, again, I, I don't want to replace government. I want them to do a better job of making th this core information. And I'm a big supporter of copyright for, for novels, right? Or for Ramachandra Guha's Gandhi book. He deserves copyright on that. For, and copyright is given to authors for a limited period of time to give them an incentive to publish. And so I'm a strong supporter of that. 60 years ceiling. Yeah, 60 years plus life. Now, I think that is too long. I, I don't think you need lifetime plus 60 years to have an incentive to be a, a publisher. But that, that's how it works for the commercial folks. And, and I am a strong supporter. But when you're looking at government... Well, it will be republished also. It's yeah. That it's a, yeah. Is, so many, many... Some books are very popular, so they, need, they have multiple... And I, I get that. I totally get it. But when we're talking about the selected works of Nehru, for example, 
when we're talking about the, the Ministry of Information needs no incentive to publish, right? They don't need copyright to publish. Uh, Sabarmati Ashram with the works of Gandhiji. Uh, if you go to the Sabarmati Ashram website, the Gandhi Heritage Portal, they've done a beautiful job, and I'm a huge fan of their work. But if you pull up Hinswaraj, you can only read it on their screen reader. And if you go to print a few pages, every page says copyright, all rights reserved, Gandhi Heritage Portal. You pull up Hinsla Raj, which on the cover so famously says no rights reserved, long out of copyright. So many people are digitizing old works, public works, and then when they put them online, they say copyright. And I think that's wrong, because the whole point of copyright is after you've had your incentive and you have exploited it commercially, when that's done, it enters the public domain. And I think it's wrong to take a book out of the public domain or a famous painting in a museum. Many museums, when they put the paintings online, they say, copyright, all rights reserved. You may not use it without our permission. And I think that's wrong. You know, paintings also may have a commercial uh, interest and value, right? So then they do. Uh, also, there's also perhaps copying, and there's so many issues that involve <laughs> 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 1800, and all you're doing is taking a straight photograph. And I understand if you've done something creative, right? If you've written commentary about the painting. That, that's a new thing. That's a new thing. But the painting itself, and you do a dead straight on photograph, there's no creativity in that. None at all. Um, I think it's wrong with a certain copyright on those. Okay, coming back to your work from India, uh, you said that um, the need for universal public knowledge is to start from India. What way is it? Well, as you know, there are vested interests that you were talking about that resist some of this, some in government, some in commercial places. India has a long history of changing how the world works over a long period of time. The fight for independence took decades. It took sustained discipline. Um, when it comes to the government of India, I take great inspiration from Aruna Roy and MKSS, who worked for 25 years, starting with small concrete projects in Rajasthan. They built a movement, and that led to the right to information law which is the strongest law in the world for right to information. I think India is a place with a thirst for knowledge, a place that doesn't believe that $1,000 books are a good thing, right, or $1,000 pills that could cure disease. Right? So um, a, a skepticism. Um, I think India has vast treasure houses of knowledge in hundreds of languages. There's, uh, of, of fields of science like Ayurvedic medicine and Unami, Unami that, that are not available, that should be cultural resources of dance and arts and, and, and plays and poems. Um, and again, a willingness to look at the hard issues. You know, and that goes back to the Buddhist councils. It goes to the fight for independence. India is a place that is willing to ask the hard questions. I also believe that um, India, uh, that India led the way in decolonization of the world, right? And that's what Gandhiji did. He did more than the liberation of India. He showed the rest of the world the way. Um, I believe information has been colonized. I believe a lot of public information has been locked up. And I think India is a place one can demonstrate a better way for doing this. I don't think it's going to start in the US or in Europe. And that's why I'm focusing on India and trying to learn, right? I, one has to be, be humble. Uh, for me, this is a jump in the deep end. India is, is vast. It's so much bigger than the U.S. The history goes back so far. And so I spent a lot of time um, just traveling around, talking to people, trying to understand what's going on. Um, and it's, it's been fascinating. It's, it's been, been good for somebody like me to, to learn. Um. You've been called a Satyagrahi. And you also wrote this book, Code Swaraj, along with Mr. Sam Patroda. So what is the book about? 
Uh, the book is about two things. Um, it is about, uh, so Sam had invited me to travel with him in India. We went to Sabarmati Ashram and did a workshop on nonviolence and I was blown away. And we got to Sabarmati Ashram and there were people like Ella Bhatt there that were talking about nonviolence and Gandhiji and um, it was just, just fascinating uh, to do that. Um, and uh, with Sam, uh, so I traveled with him a couple times and I began to learn about India and, and I began posting more and more materials and then I ended up working with him to write this book. So the book is about our travels, it's about speeches we gave, a lot about making Indian standards available, right? Um, but it's also about two other things. Uh, one is about Satyagraha. Uh, because I believe when one confronts authority, there is a certain discipline in doing that. And one can learn so much from Gandhiji. Now, what I'm dealing with is, is very different from the liberation of India, right? I don't face the personal danger. I've never been in jail. Uh, but, but I do believe that access to knowledge is a crucial issue. I believe there's a lot of resistance, particularly in government. And there are techniques, uh, a very simple one. Um, you don't sneak around in public. Right? In, uh, you don't sneak around. So if you take a government database and put it online, you don't do it and then hide and hope that nobody notices that it was you. Uh, when Gandhiji went to make salt in Dandi, before he did that, he did two things. Uh, he educated himself and his colleagues, right? So that's a lesson from Gandhi, that, that you must educate your, your peers, because if you're the only one throwing rocks at the window, you're doing it wrong. And in fact, if you're throwing rocks, you're doing it wrong. And then the other thing he did is he sent a letter to the Viceroy. Uh, very famously began, dear friend, I'm gonna go make salt. Uh, we don't have to do this, you can simply make the salt available. And so there's these techniques one learns. The second thing that is in the book is a very long essay I wrote called Note on Code Swaraj that explains my, my growing realization that if there is going to be a revolution in access to knowledge, it has to be in India. And it goes over my work with Aaron Schwartz in the United States on the PACER database. It talks about um, my, my work with Sam, but it also talks about what Hinswaraj was to me, right? It's a different book to everybody who reads it. Um, and why I believe India is the place. And then it lays out an agenda for access to knowledge of technical knowledge, the Indian standards, traditional knowledge, right? Much more information about Ayurvedic medicine could be made available. Um, and then and explains my, my reason that I believe this is the place to be. And it was the beginning of my, my beginning to commute to India every other month for a month to, to begin to learn more about the country. So it was fascinating talking Thank to you. you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, really very beneficial for Sahapidya and all of us to talk to you. Thank, right. you, so Thank you so much.